see him. Or Greg Lewis, he's another fantastic guy. Mm. Good, good. Uh, so, uh, welcome again. Before I hand over to Professor Patricia O'Brien, some uh, quick housekeeping. You know this drill quite well by now. Uh, toilets around over to your left. Uh, I'll just follow the hallway around to that direction. Uh, three fire escapes, one over near the toilet, one near the lift, uh, one over in this direction. And that reminder again, uh, apparently try not to get more than five or six people in the lift. We don't want to have a lift stuck halfway. I'm sorry, it'd be lots of fun. You can give that a shot if that sounds like fun. I would recommend it. Um, so just before I hand over uh, to Tricia to welcome you proper, uh, I th I've been reflecting on um, Darren uh, Ginelli's presentation around ownership and uh, reflecting on this when CDS heard that the Direct Support Professional Conference wasn't going to be held in Melbourne, uh, we thought we'd take ownership and run the Direct Support Professional Conference here in Sydney. So again, as I did uh, last week, I'd please uh, encourage you submit an abstract to the Direct Support Professional Conference. So we're going to have John and Connie, Lionel, Brian, Vivian Richards, Bill Tuckins, one of our keynotes. Mm -hmm. And also, I should also mention the, uh, the ACID Conference, the call for abstracts for the ACID Conference in Sydney is closing soon as well. So I encourage you to think about uh, presenting or coming along to these conferences. So that's about all for me. I'll introduce uh, Patricia O'Brien. Now you've heard me on previous occasions tell you about Patricia's work around inclusive research, inclusive education, a book that she wrote on Patricia's, Patricia's time living in a co-residency model. Um, you may not also know that Patricia's married to a Kiwi, a New Zealander, and she spent some of her life uh, over working at a university over in New Zealand, and perhaps that is why Patricia has such an extensive network of contacts of uh, fellow Kiwis as well. We might get to meet some more of today. So, uh, without any further ado, it's my honour to introduce you to Professor Patricia O'Brien. Oh, I look forward to these introductions, Sam. I just wonder what's <laughs> left. <laughs> but it uh, is true. I lived in New Zealand for 20 years and uh, a wonderful experience. And who's to say that uh, I may not return to live in New Zealand at some stage? But it actually was in New Zealand that uh, I met Lorna, Lorna Sullivan. And uh, in opening, Lorna, I would just like to introduce you before we then go around and people can introduce themselves to you. Uh, Lorna lives in Tauranga, which is uh, on the North Island, um, but it's quite a distance from where I was living. But uh, Lorna, you'll have quite an impact throughout the whole country. And if uh, we trace back your early career, uh, you worked for CCS as a National Services Advisor and prior to that for IHC. I think anybody you meet from New Zealand that works in the area of disability, particularly intellectual disability, including myself, has some connection with this organisation called IHC. But then when things started to uh, change, well before any concepts of NDISs, but um, New Zealand is quite an innovative country. Uh, Lorna took a risk and set up a small organisation called Manawa Nui in Charge, which was a small individual funding agency. <coughs> From there, Lorna set up Accessibility, which was a needs assessment agency. And more recently, Lorna has set up Imagine Better, and in your booklet you will see some outlines of some of the work that Imagine Better does. So in introducing Lorna to you, I'm introducing a person that's had the experience of large organisations and of government, but uh, Lorna also has a vision. She takes that vision into developing new strategies. When these organisations got up and running, these earlier organisations, last night we were meeting and I was asking Lorna about Imagine Better, and she said, well, one of the reasons for taking up my present position here in Canberra was that I developed a really great team, but it was time for them to step up and time for them to show their colours. So I think that's true leadership, when you can move on to allow other people to step up into your place. So Lorna, at this time you have come to Australia, you've been here for a couple of months, 
and Lorna is the Executive Director of Disability in the ACT, which is a very big job and uh, no doubt one in which we will see transformation. So could you join with me in welcoming Lorna here today? So Lorna, what I would like people to do now is we're going to go around, people will introduce themselves, state your organisation, but at the same time if you could just make a reflection on anything that's travelled with you since the last ownership breakfast. And I know some people at the last breakfast said that they were going to try and implement something. So if anybody's tried anything associated with some strategies that came out of last week or the previous weeks, that would be good to hear too. But just a general round of introductions and what you carried with you from last week. So, David, can I ask you to start? And then we'll go around this table and wind around the room, <laughs> letting Lorna know right. where, you, where you're from. Okay, David Rafferty is my name from Achieve Australia. I think it's excellent that New Zealand get a mention this morning because they've just um, passed the oh, yes. Um, yes. Um, uh, changes to the marriage law so that gays can get married from all the time, apparently. So, all, all power to them. Uh, Australia seems to be slower to move in some of these social reforms. Um, the other big highlight of my life uh, was that I was at Randwick Racecourse on oh, yeah. oh, Saturday so to watch um, uh, Black Caviar uh, run what now is their last race. Uh, so that was a really, really thrilling thing. And, um, and I wasn't thinking about um, uh, my place or anything like that during the course of my time at Randwick. Uh, um, but the, the reflection on, on my place was that um, initially I, I found it interesting that the mainstream organisation has established a kind of offshoot, which is their my place construct. And my thinking has been as a part of another mainstream organisation is that it, would it be possible for us to do that? Okay. And I guess that's a thinking process. Okay, which way are you going to pass the turn? Oh, well, we better go to Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Around that way. Okay, Megan. Hi, uh, Megan Sprague from Achieve Australia as well, too. Um, I, I guess reflections um, from the last session, my place was really stimulating. I, 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 loved, I loved that we took it back um, uh, to Achieve, and there was certainly a discussion about it. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't know, particularly from our um, human resources or people and culture department, um, was interesting in the different employment relations um, relationship that they've created in their structure, and that was very much food for thought. Um, and whether or not, you know, is that something that we would be um, flexible enough to do? Great, yes. thanks. Good. Kathy. Hi, um, Kathy Watts from Graphic Figures. Um, Reflections from the last breakfast were um, really expanded my thinking, and um, I discussed uh, the, the breakfast conversation with many people in the organisation, and had a discussion with the CEO on the way travelling home from here. And uh, there were similar things she'd heard, the same sort of thing, and um, I sort of clicked onto what she'd been talking about. So, but again, trying to see how we can. Uh, we can take some of those learnings and apply to our existing um, business, but um, looking at how uh, we can fully to implement that, how that possibly could occur. Um, but yeah, it can certainly take some of the learnings and apply to day to day. Great, good. Thanks, Kathy. Would you like to welcome, welcome and introduce okay. yourself? <laughs> Hi, my name's Maria and I'm from Woodville Community Services. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it last conversation. I was completely understaffed and I'm very upset about it. Mm. I heard it was <laughs> mind blowing. I was, I love coming here. Okay. It was very inspiring, Thanks. but yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, my name is Trish Wakey, I'm from Forsyth, Australia, and we've only just changed our business <coughs> name as from yesterday. And it's much um, a nightmare. <laughs> we're very excited about it. Uh, we were the Forsyth Foundation for Deaf and Blind Adults, and it isn't a mouthful to say when someone asks you where you work. Uh, look, I too was impressed with my place. I had heard that um, there was a conversation with involving that yeah, last sure year. Yes, sure. and I'd, I'd really, that had fired up my imagination or my <coughs> vision before, that we do have two homes where we could have micro boards. Mm -hmm. It's very 
nicely. Um, their houses with, I do have a plan for one house to actually give people like a little flat or flatbed, you know, so mm -hmm. they could just at least make a cup of coffee safely. They have um, sensory impairments, but they, they would, you know, these are people who could do that. Uh, the other thing is I met with um, Aging Disability and Home Care mm -hmm. this week. Um, I'm working on a joint partnership, a partnership, a joint project rather with them, and they were very interested in um, what I was telling them. That, you know, I'm attending this because ADAC is not really getting that information. They're sort of a bit of a backwater. Just mm -hmm. on that, um, we did invite Jim Longley to come to the last breakfast, oh, but yeah. he's unable to make it. So uh, we're still. That's we a might think of someone else. Then. Well, we asked for that, but we've, we've still got to work on it. Great, thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Lena <coughs> Lincoln. I, as well, am from Corsite, uh, Australia. <laughs> Corsite, Australia. We just changed <laughs> yesterday. Um, my thoughts on the last um, session was just it, it, it made me just think um, what our services are going to look like next, how our programs can develop, and it was just very encouraging to be part of that conversation last time. Great, thank you. Good morning, I'm Mariana, also from Foresight Australia. Um, again, very innovative, fabulous <coughs> ideas. Gave us a, a new perspective on thinking about service delivery for our residents. Uh, and the other thing I guess that it did was kind of between the three of us made us think and discuss that for most of between sort of the last breakfast session and today. So I think that that speaks volumes in itself. Great been a good catalyst. Mm. Well, we'll move to this table. Sure, would you like to uh, give us your reflection on last week? <coughs> My name is Shirley and I am from North Cod. Yesterday I did a short workshop to a small group and got their input on what their knowledge of the changes in level of risk they will take. Some of the clients said our knowledge of the changes included things such as changes to individual funding. They would like to have more choices to choose from. For example, they would want the option to go to TAFE if they wanted to. They would also like to direct their funding towards different needs such as recreation and mobility needs. The clients want more independence over their life. It was also suggested that they wanted more say in directing their funding where they want. The level of risk that the clients were willing to take in the service was also discussed. The clients felt that they had the fear that something will hurt them. They suggested that training was also needed to manage the funding. The lack of knowledge about this could be a risk. They have a concern about where to direct the funds. Also, they would like explanations or training on how to budget effectively. Not being skilled in budgeting can make the clients feel a little scared and overwhelmed. There is the element of not having enough <laughs> knowledge on financial control and therefore there is a fear of the unknown amongst the clients. The clients find mm -hmm. that they are unsure of who to talk to and where to go to seek assistance. Overall, the clients find it a bit scary to manage everything on their own. Thanks very much, Shirley. Yeah. Uh, a great piece of work that you've done in between breakfasts. Mm. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to thank you for putting so much energy into uh, getting that uh, written up too. Uh, mm. Thank you. Um, I think there's just so much there that we could continue mm. to talk on. You getting insight into what really matters is how people with disability want it to work, so thank you. Uh, hi, 
Hi, my name is Lydia, and I'm here to support uh, Financial Week. Last week I was here, and I really enjoyed learning about my kids. Hi, Ben from Northcott. Um, I guess for me, from last breakfast, um, like I sat and spoke with my manager, and we discussed similar to Foresight Australia, like where we could identify where we could use micro boards and also <coughs> circles of support. Because at North, at the moment, we don't really do a lot of that, and that's something that we really want to get into and help people with those sort of informal supports. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Hello, I'm Gillian from Sunshine. Um, I wasn't here last time, so um, unfortunately I cannot. I have discussed with um, with Jackie, my, my boss, one who was here, and um, she was really excited. And, and um, yeah, we have a lot more to talk about um, because there is so much that, that can change in South Africa. Great, thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you. Gillian's here because obviously people from Sunshine can't come, so do keep that in mind. If you can't come, uh, send somebody else. So mm -hmm. you're most welcome. Mm -hmm. Chris, can we start with you? Uh, Chris Campbell from the Junction Works. Um, and uh, in regards to last uh, last conversation, I found it quite good because I'd heard of my place and it had been um, put forward, um, especially in sort of working groups with Tadic around that gets the model to go to, and it would actually sort of the, the industrial thing, sort of, I thought, yeah, that's how they could do it. We've got common law contracts in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if New South Wales was able to actually recreate some of those possibilities, I think then, then you would open up more, um, more choice and more flexibility for people with disabilities. Um, but from, from last, uh, last time, it actually confirmed sort of where <coughs> where the junction works, where we wanted to sort of operate within, um, so to be clear about what we wanted to do. There's still, and I'm not too sure in the, whether it's going to be in one of the conversations, but there's a lot of focus on the person with the disability, which is obviously the, the, the primary, primary issue, but there's an area of influence which is called the family, and there's still, there's still not been sort of conversation around how do you actually engage both especially when they have different perspectives on what what life holds. Um, I think there was then you were sort of saying, I think there was the last one or the one before, where um, you know, like it's, uh, it's probably more convincing than not. So what you're yeah. able to do rather than... And, we, and we've got families like that. Their, their whole life has been around supporting their sons and daughters uh, in the best way that they think. Uh, sometimes that's been very promoting and then other times it's been a little bit restricting. So um, I think that's an area that sort of I think needs to be, because otherwise, if you ignore the family, you ignore the elephant in the room. Um, so yeah, from a from a legislative point of view, if, if New South Wales can sort of recreate some of the flexibility of common yeah. contracts, that'd be an interesting process. Um, courageous, probably, from a government point of view. Um, and then from sort of from a from an organisational point of view is how do you actually engage families and, and the individuals? Well, I'm sure Mum's going to touch on some family stories today. Mm. So great. Peter. Um, Peter Knight from Wesley Mission. Um, and one thing that uh, particularly we've heard during the uh, last seminar from my place is um, we were approached by uh, some new families to provide a service for them. And, you know, we often do the, the disability uh, my plan and, and, and that sort of thing. But one of the elements that we added into um, the discussion was sort of a, a memorandum of understanding around um, uh, not, not so much their disability management, but their, their fund management and how they would do that. And it just, it, I don't know, it kind of just took on a completely different flavour around um, sort of outlining a pathway to say, well, th this might be the ideal. I don't know if we're going to get there straight away, but, you know, we're going to take some steps to do that. And we want you to know that's in our mind um, in terms of being self-managed even more than sort of just self-directed or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a great seminar to encourage that. Thanks, Peter. Paula. Paula and Martin from Wesley Mission as well. Um, I wasn't at the last breakfast conversation, however, I will back on um, Peter's comments too, um, very heavily engaged with 
our families and looking at this new piece of work in terms of accommodation. And I think the creation of the MOU which we are doing has created um, uh, great robust conversation um, between service providers um, and these families and, and the, the, the clients themselves are actually children, they're 11, 12 years of age, so it's about a shared care model um, which supports the family to maintain the family unit. You know, that many of these families are at the point of re relinquishment. Uh, so it's a model around um, being in a, 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 a shared service four days a week and three days back in the family unit. And it's about how do we actually make that work? Um, and, and having um, conversations that traditionally you just don't have, yes, you know, yes. and, and not and getting coming to the table and, and being quite open and frank about those conversations and actually putting on the table saying, I actually don't have the answers mm -hmm. and being quite honest about that yes, yes, with yes. families and, and because I think they came with the vision that you'll solve all our problems, whereas we came with the vision, well, there's a new world out there where we'd like to take you on this journey with us mm -hmm. and, and support you through this process. So it's been a very interesting um, conversation today and I think, you know, sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back <coughs> and those sorts of things and I think that's just the way it needs to be though, to really get to the essence of what you're trying to, to do and support the family. So it's mm -hmm. been it's been really interesting. Sounds like great change. Mm -hmm. It's very challenging for an organisation like Wesley. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot of that information has come from these breakfasts as yeah, well, hasn't it? It's good. No, yeah. Just good. to try and put it into practice as well. Yeah. Hi, Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Tony. I'm from the United Care Disability. Unfortunately, I wasn't here last week, uh, last conversation, sure, so I do apologise for that. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here today. I was here last year for a few of the conversations and um, very, very fruitful. Um, so I'm looking forward to taking part in the conversation today. You're very welcome. Julie. Hi, I'm Julia McCready from the United Care Disability. I was here last time. Um, <clears throat> from the last one, I guess apart from you know, my own reflection, um, I had a chat with our director about um, and she'd heard the previous one. She, she'd heard Greg Lewis. Yeah, yeah. yeah from the previous one. So we had a chat about what you know, my place do and how does that I guess in the last period since our last one, there's been a number of opportunities for us as, as um, strategic managers to sit down and start talking about well, where are we going and what are we doing and, and looking at those different models that we've heard from the board. So there's a fair bit of discussing that now. Good. Good. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Karen Stacks. I work with National Disability Services in Pauline's family. Um, so um, this is my very first breakfast. Uh, I'm based in the Hunter. So the role is around working with organisations to think about what some of the changes in sector reforms might mean for them and where we're going with that. So I have, um, obviously I haven't been any breakfast before, but I have had a little bit of familiarity with some of the micro board stuff that mm -hmm. from a um, family advocacy conference last year where mm -hmm. a lot of families presented around those sorts of models and what that might look like for them. So they always have a good conference in India. Mm. Yeah, again, fairly challenging. I was there as a service provider, and again, you know, really interesting to hear things mm. from that perspective. And yes. so it was quite challenging as a service provider to think sure. about, yeah, yeah, God, we do, you know, that sort yeah. of stuff. So, so thank you very much. It's fine. Yes, we'll pick up a little before we finish the table over there. Just mm. a reflection. on how uh, I'm in a, a position where um, I can talk perhaps a bit more uh, strongly about some of the, the changes. And so uh, Ben and I were in Dubbo last uh, week uh, facilitating a couple of workshops to our staff and parents. And I think we used the opportunity um, to be um, you know, quite strong about the need for cultural change within our organisation. And, um, uh, Quite a few of the parents were very keen about you know, asking us questions about what was happening in their kind of broader sector, and so we talked um, openly about that as well. So I think we were trying to think about how to use the opportunities that we have in our roles and um, to talk um, about the challenges and actually kind of bring those challenges to everybody who's working in the economy. And the support and the support workers as well, not just the managers. Sam, do you want to make a comment and then we'll, we'll come then to Claire and myself. Um, so yeah, 
great to be at um, Breakfast with the Kitchen again. I've got uh, Dan, who's fantastic class with me. Mm. I'm sure Rob's going to be fantastic this week. Mm. Uh, I'll leave all those bits and pieces about. Thank you for doing your survey, Mark, in before mm. I'll leave all of that for Dan. <laughs> I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the last breakfast. I hadn't heard um, about my place before, so it was really, I guess, eye-opening and inspiring to hear Darren talk, and I really enjoyed it. Um, Michael Lawson, Catholic Care Sydney. Um, uh, I think yeah, probably a couple of upper mind reflections were the opportunities and the challenges around the both the governance and the industrial side of things there so that that were covered last week. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenge in both, and I, and I guess a reflection around making this work on the ground is going to, you know, stating the obvious, but will involve system yeah. and structural changes, probably to really enact it in a three-dimensional way, um, and also just the desire for more information. And after that, and coincidentally, our CEO, who's going to Perth to visit his daughter, who's recently married on holidays tomorrow, he bought his <laughs> leave one day earlier, so Darren's hosting him today for a couple of hours, so mm -hmm. just the way it worked out, so so I'll have an opportunity to find out a bit more. Well, my own reflection is uh, that I think my place really began uh, with a group of like-minded people getting together who had a history of working in services, they wanted to break loose, and uh, that's what they're continuing to do. So. I think coming together as a group of like-minded people um, to have conversations, to dream together can sometimes lead to some really good outcomes. So Claire, welcome. Uh, Emma, welcome. Uh, Emma's joining us again. Uh, and uh, you'll be great today. So I don't know whether you'd like to make an opening statement or comment. Or um, no, well, I'm still kind of reflecting back on breakfast one and two and some of the work they've done. Um, that was nothing on last <laughs> so, well, thank you for really a rich round of reflections. And uh, before I hand over to Lorna, I just want to um, direct your attention to the book. Just to quickly tell you that the first pages in the booklet cover things about leadership. Uh, they're taken from different articles that I've found to be quite useful. So um, they also describe my place, Memre, and another organisation in Melbourne, Belonging Matters. And then after the front section of the book, there is some information about some of Lorna's work. But the two articles at the back are really quite lengthy. But if you really do just want to catch up with, you know, well, what is a micro board? Um, what, is it, what is the company of friends? Uh, what are ways in which individualised funding has been done in Saskatchewan and across other parts of Canada, I think they're very, very worthwhile. So if you've got staff that are wondering about um, what they can do, uh, a quick but yet informed read, uh, I'd recommend some of the, the work in the booklet. And uh, of course, some of it refers to the two texts that we're working from or that we've distributed throughout the session. So, Lorna, if I could invite you to come up. Thank you very much. I'll just get the slides up. Thanks for inviting me. Look, what I'd, I'd just like to start, I guess, by responding because it was really, really interesting to listen to people's reflections as um, you went around the room and to kind of relate them back to places that I've been in and how we've sort of thought about responding to some of those um, issues. And I think it's really interesting, isn't it, this issue of um, family. <coughs> Because when I hear the um, struggles of families, the first thing that happens for me is we've really let these families down. We've failed to give to families a sense of what's possible 
And in fact, what we tend to have given to families is a sense of what's not possible. And from a very early uh, point in their lives, and then we blame them for not um, understanding vision and and risk taking, even though we ourselves are often operating in very risk averse kind of environments. So I think it's very, very difficult for families. And this was one of the challenges that, um, if we're talking about innovation, that we took on very early because one of the things that we could see occurring, even right back from the time of when we started to engage in deinstitutionalization in the 80s, we could see that families essentially created the tipping point. And if you invested in families, you could bring a tipping point, a change uh, forward much more quickly. And in fact, of course, systems don't essentially bring about change on their own. They bring about change because they're forced to bring about change. And so we started investing in family leadership um, and my experiences Really, it took us about four years of very, very intensive investment in family leadership before we started to have families taking those leadership roles. And one of the things that we learnt um, quite early really was families might come with a sense of we don't like what is, but we don't know what could be. And part of the role of, in engaging families is giving them the sense of what could be because once they've got that, then they drive the system to change. Um, and it was interesting to listen to the struggles that people have of the fact that you want to do uh, these innovative things, but you're trapped in systems that effectively um, restrict the capacity for innovation. And certainly in, in the work, in, this, in the agencies that I have established if that's kind of innovation I'm not sure if it is but the two things that we did was listen to what people were saying listening to what Shirley has said this morning just made me think okay look here's a whole lot of strategies and processes that we could now immediately from this breakfast start to implement um, and how do you create the systems to do it I think that people who are working in very large systems are going to always find this difficult. And the auspicing off or the, the establishing of a, a semi-autonomous uh, agency is not always straightforward either. In my experience, is it's, it has to be a lot of planning and careful, carefully setting these things up from the outset because the strength of the larger organisation, the tension is always back to it, and it's quite perverting in a lot of ways. For a lot of the work that I have done around Imagine Better Accessibility, a little agency called Tofano Kotahi, which we established um, some 15 years or so ago, and Mano Anui, some of the principles we've used around that is don't try to be everything to everybody, understand what it is you're doing and start that it doesn't matter how small it is now the interesting thing is probably i think the two most successful little agencies that i've been part of over the last 20 years has been imagine better and manu anui and manu anui in charge which we set up as an individualized funding agency to answer many of the questions and concerns that surely uh, raised this morning around how do we do this? How do we take authority when effectively we've not had much authority over anything, let alone any money, um, to solve those problems for people? Not to employ, not to provide a service, but to simply say, what would make this management role easier for you? We'll do that. Payroll, taxes, making sure your staff have got proper contracts. So you just go ahead and live your life and we'll take care of the back end. And imagine better essentially um, is what it says it is. It's how do you create something that's better uh, than what we currently have. And that's, those agencies we started with nothing. 
Now Imagine Better, for example, has been in operation for 15 years and has not received a cent of government funding. And it's one of the best agencies I have ever had engagement with. And the reason is, it's about you only stay in business if you're of service to the people who want to use you. And the other thing that we had to think about with Imagine Better, two things um, that we had to think about with Imagine Better was we don't want to create an agency which is simply somewhere where people again become dependent. And the role of the agency, as somebody said uh, this morning, is just to solve problems and fix it. What we needed Imagine Better to do was to ensure that people with disabilities and their families stayed in control of their lives. Um, so that was quite a challenge to us because what that meant was you couldn't create anything, if you know what I mean. We talk about um, person-centeredness. It's interesting. Uh, in all of the all of the organisations I work with and support around the world, really, everybody, every agency is person-centred. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you'd be a very brave agency, wouldn't you, to say you weren't? Uh, but when you look at the agencies, in fact, every decision of any you know value at all essentially is made before you even know who the people are you're going to serve. Your contracts are signed, your, your programs are set, your staff are employed, your budget's determined, your volumes, your numbers, your client group, all of this. And if there's anything left over, well, we'll let the person with a disability decide about that, maybe, so long as it fits with the program. Um, so, you know, it's almost like we've got person-centeredness. It is it, because we say it is. And I think some of this is what we have to be careful around when we're talking about innovation and change. With Imagine Better, what we had to do was to say, we haven't got anything. Um, you, you, you're very welcome. But when families would come and ask us what we had to offer, we had to say nothing. But don't worry about that because we'll sit down with you and work it out. And again, I think the, the Wesley Mission's view of, we'll say yes to everything even if we don't know how to do it, because that's how you form partnership. We'll say, yes, this is possible. No idea how we're gonna make it possible, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. And essentially, um, that type of process forces innovation, doesn't it? Because you can't say, oh, have we got the answer for you? It's this standardized thing that we've got over here and we've got a space so you can fit into it. So those are some of the things I want to um, talk about, really. I, I kind of smile at myself when I'm asked to talk about innovation because um, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, I'm, I'm not um, really sure why I would be an innovator, particularly in respect of uh, the lives of people with disabilities. Um, because it would seem to me that the work that I've done over the last 40 odd years really has simply um, just been engaging what I would call the realm of the ordinary, not the realm of innovation. Um, and I, I guess for me it raises some quite significant issues around how far from the ordinary the lives of people with disabilities really are. And how the ordinary and to me, the ordinary is just this simply question, well, what could be possible? We don't often ask that. Um, it's, a, it's a good starting point around people. Well, because how do we know what could be possible? When I started work in this field, you can tell it was a long time ago, I, um, nothing was possible. You know, I, I started work in an institution called Kimberley. Some of you might know it. Um, it, it worked on the premise that um, people with Down syndrome, for example, were incapable of learning. And yet we know that that's not true. We don't actually know what potential people have, but we presume. Um, and so, you know, when people's lives intersect with the formal service system, 
In fact, the ordinary becomes even less attainable, irrespective of the words that we uh, tend to use around it. And it just takes me back to, um, I did some work for the New Zealand government just on 10 years ago now. Uh, it was to really look at the status of the lives of people, with, of adults living with an intellectual disability in New Zealand. And it was called the To Have an Ordinary Life Report. Yeah. You may have seen it where you can get copies of that. And the way we did that across the country was we just sat in uh, rooms like this with groups of people with an intellectual disability and um, families. And I vividly remember one um, parent saying to me, she said, my daughter had to give up her life in order to get a service. Yeah. Um, she said, as soon as she stepped into the service world, she lost everything that was of value to her. She'd had to move out of the neighborhood that she had lived her whole life in because there was a vacancy. So the person became a vacancy filler. You know, um, she had to give up. She she gave all of the relationships of the people that knew her in that community over twenty odd years: Fa uh, shopkeepers, business owners, neighbours, casual acquaintances. She had to give up her little part-time job that she had taken years to achieve, and she'd had to give up all her social relationships because now she was compelled to engage in the social relationships that the other people who lived in the house um, were compelled uh, to live in. And it was interesting when you looked at that report, there were three overall findings. And they were disastrous, worrying and hopeful. And where the lives of people with disabilities became disastrous was where they intersected with the human service system because that was the point at which they lost essentially all effective control. Where they were worrying was just simply the fact that people with disabilities in New Zealand and Australia is no different, live in perpetual poverty. They live with very low expectations of their capacity. They live with low educational opportunities, very low participation in the workforce, very, a very limited ownership, very limited um, engagement. And where it was hopeful, was where we were starting to see a very strong movement of disabled persons organisations, People First, um, Disabled Persons Assembly, uh, those organisations were beginning at that point in time to drive some change in thinking. So, you know, for me, the way we respond to people essentially reflects the beliefs and assumptions we hold about people. And even if we don't bring those beliefs and assumptions to consciousness, we still enact them. And in effect, our society still sees people with disabilities as different from us, somehow not as human almost as us. And our systems and agencies essentially are set up to reflect the perspective of society. So even if we don't bring these kind of beliefs to consciousness, we demonstrate them in the way in which we respond to and define the lives of people. And essentially what our service systems do is define what is a, the type of life a person with a disability is able to pursue, and we use our programs and our systems and our structures uh, in order to do that. So if we step back from society and therefore step back from our systems and just ask these simple questions, I think, what could be possible in the life of this person? What would make sense if we were going to support that possibility to come to fruition? And how might we be of service to that life and to that life? Potential. That, I think, for some reason means we've stepped into the realm of innovation. Um, so in lots of ways I see innovation as nothing more than responding to the ordinary uh, hopes and aspirations of a person's life. So if I look at the NDIS, it would seem to me that the process of, of innovation under the NDIS is really nothing more than a conceptual shift from being 
a service in the lives of people to being of service to the lives of people. It's a simple thing, but structurally quite difficult because in effect, structurally it means we almost have to go back to what do we have to offer other than how can we be of assistance uh, to you. And I think that right now, I mean I've been in Australia for two months so I know everything, um, but it would seem to me we're caught up in essentially what almost appears to me to be the euphoria of an NDIS, you know, this somehow or another. We, are, uh, we appear to be acting as if what is essentially a restructured funding mechanism is somehow going to result in fundamental life changes for people. And it will be a panacea for everything that hasn't been in place up until now. You know, I mean, you just look at the, the language you get that's going around choice and control. For people, for whom the majority of their lives have not even been able to make the choice over who they live with, or what they eat, or whether they, somebody was talking to me in the, the ACT government runs a lot of services, and somebody said to me the other day, so and so had absconded. Well, you guys have all absconded this morning because you're clearly not where you're meant to be. So if we, if we kind of use that language about somebody going for a walk, we're a very long way from choice and control. And Shirley raised all these issues about how do we manage? Where is the sudden savviness of consumers going to come from? Because you know, the one thing we absolutely do know is that money doesn't do thinking. Just because you've got money, money doesn't think. And if we, as people with disabilities, as families, as allies, as, and providers are not going to do the thinking and do it now, then where do we think this innovation is going to come from? Because you are talking about a group of people, you know, oftentimes who have been so oppressed in their lives that they accept almost anything. And if we're not careful, the NDIS will simply be a more expensive version of what currently doesn't work for people. And I liked the question on the board this morning, are you the owner of that change? Because the authority for it, while the, the rhetoric is that it belongs to people with disabilities, the authority for it still very much sits with the system. What the NDIS will do, I think, and therefore what will make innovation possible, is that it's going to free up the money and free up the structures around that money so that it gives you permission and gives you some mechanisms to do the thinking and to bring that vision into reality. But it's very, very important that you realise it does not create the vision, it doesn't do the thinking, and it will not create the strategies that are required for good lives to emerge. This can only happen if there are new ways of thinking, new sets of relationships and new strategies. Now, so to me, innovation within an NDIS environment is really thinking about this issue of transformation. And I'm hearing a lot of rhetoric around me and around the work that I'm doing on reform. And reform worries me because it, reform is simply about reforming what exists. Transforming is taking a new form. <coughs> and if I think of the NDIS, then this is about the transformation of people's lives, not the transformation of human services. And if we focus on transforming people's lives, then the service system is going to need to respond and transform itself in response to people's lives. I think one of the most uh, exciting things for me around the NDIS is evidence that we live at a time when there is really much unprecedented opportunity for seeing the lives of people with a disability being lives that are lived to the full. And as um, 
participant members of community just like everyone else. And this, you know, is probably the most welcome development that I've seen in my uh, lifetime. Largely because people with disabilities have really suffered greatly in not being seen as fully human, you know, and not being treated as unique and interesting individuals in their own right. And all of the attention has seemed to have gone to endlessly evaluating and determining who people are not, what people cannot be, what people will never become, what we might need to do to fix them. NDIS gives us the opportunity to unleash the hope and potential that exists in people's lives. Um, because, you know, it's almost always true, in my experience, it doesn't matter whether it's people with disabilities themselves, whether it's families, health professionals, therapists, teachers, we always seem to underestimate rather than overestimate what could be possible in the lives of people. And I think a key reason for this and a key reason why innovation is so difficult to achieve is the extent to which most of us are, are actually limited in our beliefs by what we have not yet seen or not yet experienced. You know, I sort of liken it to the white swan principle. Living in New Zealand, all swans are black. Okay. And I sort of think, well, like my grandsons, if I said to them what colour is a swan, they would say it was black. But when you've seen one white one, you can't ever be sure, can you? There could be another white one. And this is the same with the lives of people with disabilities. Because we don't see these lives being lived to the full, we're not sure that we really believe it's possible. So we become limited and we also limit ourselves around this issue of what we call practical and reasonable. And so what we tend to do is to foreclose on what's possible because we can't practically figure out how to do anything different. And it's, so the, the principle that I work around with innovation is I, call, I, I believe we need to be sensibly unrealistic. Because if we're not unrealistic, we're going to stay where we are. We are going to invest in more of what we already know because we are not certain <coughs> about how we get to the, the, what we don't know. We have to open our minds to innovation. I think we are deeply skeptical, very dismissive of what is new, not because we don't want to engage it, but because the old is so comfortable. Even if it's not very satisfying, we know how to do it, and we sit well with it, even if the lives of people with disabilities are burdened by it. And I often um, use this little phrase, you know, if we settle for something, then people with a disability have no option but to settle for it. So how broad is our vision? Because I think it's absolutely certain that people with a disability today are not living up to the potential that they have, not because of any personal limitations that they have, but because those of us who are responsible for the promotion and development of what might be possible are ourselves too beset with fears with anxieties and with stereotypes of our own. And we have limited the vision and potential of people and we have restricted their capacity to have lives that are purposeful and, and meaningful. And uh, that I think is, is <coughs> our parents, as families, as educators and professionals, we're closing down because we don't know we don't know how to protect ourselves. We're worried about our risk. We're worried about important situations. We start from what we already know rather than starting from this issue of um, what would be possible. So innovation, I believe, starts first by looking at today's reality. Because if today's reality is not enabling the lives of people with disabilities to be lived to the full, 
then we've got to question what today's reality, why are we engaged in today's reality? Because it's clearly not helpful. I think innovation begins when we start to ask the questions, what do you think might be better than what we've got today? Yeah, if you're going to be innovators in support of better lives, then you can't stay married to the life that you've got now. And we've got to look past today to see what could be there and how are we going to engage in the creation of new possibility. So I think to be an innov innovator essentially is to have a picture of what is perceived as possible. That's the first uh, point, because if you have no picture of what could be possible, then it's going to be very difficult to become active around pursuing. To have that picture, it means we've got to change the stereotypes and assumptions that we've surrounded ourselves with and surrounded the lives of people with disabilities with. If we could just shift our focus and put it on the competencies, the abilities and the possibilities that people have, rather than on the struggles and the challenges and the risks and then we start to shift the cultural engagement that we have with people. When we provide the supports and the encouragements and the opportunities for people to demonstrate what they are capable of, then we begin to create different expectations for the people themselves, for the people that are around them, and this then starts to become innovation and action. Now, you know, if we look at how, how our service systems describe themselves. We talk about independence, we talk about competency development, <coughs> we talk about uh, building relationships, and yet everything we do works against those um, opportunities for people. So we very seldom see people with disabilities who are supported by systems actively managing their own homes, for example, actually engaging their own staff, actually purchasing for their own home, actually actively seeking the work that they want to engage in. We, we build our systems of protection around people and then hope that lives uh, might change. But I think once you, you can imagine a life that's better, imagine a future that's possible, then this becomes much more attainable if you start to articulate that and share it with people. You know, I sort of think innovation in a way is kind of like being on a diet. If you don't tell anyone, you're going to go and eat one of those little pies, aren't you? Because you think, oh, no, no one's going to know. But if you tell everybody, then you engage your allies. <coughs> then you will have other people, you know, when you go to get that pie, come up and say to you, hang on, I thought you were doing this. Um, well, you can't do this and this. And this is some of the things that I think agencies struggle with, and it's what you would call coherency to your vision. So that, to me, is another very important aspect of innovation. I bet all of the agencies in this room have got mission statements that are superb. But how often do you sit down and say, is what we're doing today taking us to that? Because if it's not, why are we doing it? And so this is a coherency discussion that needs to happen, I think, at every single board meeting. The board should be charging the agency, essentially, with what are you doing to achieve your vision and giving you license and permission to move towards that vision. I think one of the things that makes innovation difficult is that once you start on this pathway, you run up against what I call the naysayers, the skeptics, the risk averse people, the people who say this can't happen, you know, the people who uh, lay all the fears. Uh, my strategy for those people is just to move past as quickly as you possibly can and um, simply engage with the people who say, that could be interesting. You know, how might we think about that? Just find those people and keep them really close to you and walk with them. Because this is also the starting point of a movement for social change. You can't do innovation all by yourself. It's Innovation is this group of people in this room walking 
together on these struggles. Because once you've got that idea of what the future could look like, you've got to then take yourself out of this discussion and start to test it. And that's, once you get yourself into the testing mode, could, could we do this? How might we test it out? Then you've actually started to act as an innovator. And I think one of the things that we find really difficult about that is these ideas never come to us fully formed. You know, innovation tends to arrive in the rough, tends to arrive kind of unshaped because it's a bit messy really, it's a bit like a dream, it's a bit like how are we going to grasp these things. And it needs a lot of refining, it needs a lot of polishing, it needs a, a lot of uh, support over time. You know, I think of innovation often a lot like Maxwell Smart, are there any people old in this room old enough to remember Maxwell Smart? Yeah, but not many Not many well, <laughs> Maxwell Smart had a phone in his room, do you remember that? Yeah. And that to us was hilarious. Like, how impossible is that? Well, now you see people walking down the street with things in their ears talking to themselves. But Maxwell Smart couldn't have imagined that. But that was the starting point of innovation. We won't get it perfect, but each iteration of it will be better than the last. And so the idea of the Memorandum of Understanding down here with Phoenix is a beginning point of taking action towards innovation. In 10 years time, you'll look back at that and say, gosh, that was a fairly rough kind of idea we had, but it was worth having because it took us to the next idea and somebody else will pick that idea up and make it smart. And your my place people, you know, they've gone further and you're starting to say, well, maybe we could do something that might look smarter than my place because that's innovation in action. I think that one of the other things that we do in our systems is we get very tied up in our system. And that takes all of our energy. And what that leaves us with then is what I would call a weak vision. Because we are engaged in the day-to-day -day practical delivery of things rather than in the innovative design. Now the organisation that I was talking about um, and I think this speaks to some of this, how do you all spice things? Accessibility was an organisation that I set up around needs assessment. At a time when needs assessment really was needs assessment. I have to say, perversion arrives very quickly on the scene. And to be an innovator, you've got to be very, very aware of how things start to become perverted and how quickly they become perverted and then have strategies for pulling them back. Um, imagine, better, uh, imagine Better was seeded then from accessibility because accessibility recognised that needs assessment was no longer needs assessment, it was in fact the management of a scarce resource and people's needs were being defined by the resource that was available. Uh, and so um, spun Imagine Better off with the mission to achieve the goals that accessibility now found that it couldn't achieve. And some of that, I think, is a very good way of thinking because if your system is, tra if you are trapped in your system to compliance <coughs> with this and um, employment regulations with that, and you can create another system that is safeguarded from those things, that you can put a bureaucratic shield up against then it makes it much more possible. Some family governed options, for example, or self-determined options where people with disabilities in fact manage their own affairs. And you can see some of those in Australia. At the nightlife service in um, Melbourne, for example, and the mobile attendant care service in Brisbane are services that have been auspiced to the lives of the people who use them and shielded by the host agency from the bureaucratic constraints. What was that one, sorry? Nightlife in Melbourne and what was the other uh, one? Mobile Attendant Care Service in Brisbane. Oh, sorry, it's sorry. called MAX, I think. Mobile, mobile Attendant Care. care. Oh, yeah, thanks, 
I think that one of the other things that you need to think about in innovation is it's the hopes and dreams of people that are the substance no. of it. It's not our kind of grand ideas, it's the issues that Shirley's brought. It's, it's the hopes and dreams and fears of people because these then become the practical things that you're addressing and that will attain better lives and that you learn how to do it better uh, for the next time. It's never the other way around. And some of my scepticism in a way around programs like the NDIS, I think they're fantastic, let's hope it happens, is government doesn't tend to develop innovation because innovation only comes from the needs of people. The needs of people uh, have to be addressed. So you can never become innovative once everything is in place. And we often find agencies get bogged down with this. They think, well, we'll become innovative once we've got the funding. Or we'll become innovative once we've got the supports or the professionals or the building or the... And once you've got all those things, of course, you're no longer innovative. You're simply back where you started from. You're already trapped into those solutions before you've got a sense of where it is you really wanting to go with them. Um, what else I think the other thing is about how do you get started? And it's interesting because in fact you can only start from here. How do you get started on innovation? Is you have to start where you are, you have to start um, where the people that you are supporting are. So you can't just say, oh, well, we'll only get innovative with the people who've got the big vision. Or we'll only get innovative with the people who really know what it is that they're wanting. You have to figure out, how do I get innovative with this person who's been maybe deeply trapped in an institutional environment? What could I do uh, for this person? I think some of that thinking comes from my upbringing. It just, oh, I had an Irish father who, if you asked him, how did you do something or how did you get somewhere, he'd say, oh, well, now I'd not be starting from here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we are. So this is where we have to start. You start by asking the question, for this person, what would be better? And for some people, it might not be much. You don't worry about the disability. That comes, dis the disability and the money come last in the question of innovation. Because if you start with money or you start with disability, you immediately start with the assumption of what you can't do. Those things, once you've figured out what it is that's wanted and needed, then you come back to those things because they are simply strategies for overcoming. For this person then to achieve that, what are we going to need to do? Because that's where the supports lie. If it's, you know, innovation can be simply as little as asking, what would this person enjoy in their life? Often people will say to me, well, how do you get innovative with people who are multiply disabled and no language. Just ask yourself, what would make each day a good day for this person? What would bring the most joy into this person's life? One of the processes that we often use in starting with families, let's, let's not think about anything else but take a piece of paper and write down the five or six most important things to you in your life. What are the five or six most important things that would make life of value to you? And I can tell you, they are family, they are friends, they are a sanctuary or a home where I feel safe and secure, their, their purpose and contribution, their financial security, and then there tend to be a range of things like hope for the future, or things that come into that kind of arena. Now, if you don't know where to start with someone, write those things down and get them right. Because if you get them right, then you change the lives of people and you change the expectations that people have of their lives. Pay attention to what the person's passionate about. I'll, um, I've got a couple of little examples, so I think you can talk to your about what you're passionate about. Um, I have a friend
particularly young men that I met when he was 15 years old. He was a young man on this end of the altar. As you can see, he's a man with Down syndrome. But if you look at the picture, that's not the first thing you see, is it? In fact, sometimes you have to look quite hard at the picture to see. Then you see, oh, that person's got no. That's the result of an image. It's where people simply are part of. And this, this photo I like because I think this is what your life looks like when you, as a service or a person who engages in supporting people gets it right. You can see that um, you've got the setting right. I'll tell you the story about this young man. I met him when he was 15. He was in a Catholic secondary school can in Auckland. The microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. He was in a Catholic secondary school in Auckland. He was the first person with a disability ever to have gone into the school. He was the first member of a third generation of families to go to the school. And his mother said to me, I'm sure they took him because they felt obliged. But of course didn't know what to do uh, when he got there. Which I find really interesting, isn't it? Because actually what schools do is teach people. Um, but because this person looked different, they had an assumption that what they did for other people uh, wouldn't kind of work out for this person. His family entered our service when he was 15, when his mother came to me and said, I, we can't do this anymore, we're going to have to take him to a special school, I cannot go to that school one more time. She said, I can see before I even hit the gate that they're saying, here comes that woman. She said, the only relationship I have with that school is conf confrontational. I can't do this. So we had to, our first question was, what do you want? I want my son to finish his schooling in this school. That's all that's in my mind right now. I, that's what I want. So that was our role. Now how are we going to do that? Well, we had to think about what would it take? You see, you start with this is what we're going to achieve. What would it take to achieve that? After conversations with the family, we thought there were two things. The family were burning out. They were, going, they were at the end of their tether. They were going to say, let's put them in a special school and we know what happens from there. We go from special school to sheltered day service to residential service and that was not a path uh, that we had in mind for this young man. So the family needed support and the school needed support. Um, we're very quick to blame, you see. We're very quick to say they did wrong or they couldn't figure this out or they whatever. They needed support. And the, the, the strategy we used for this family was a circle of support. Um, so it was interesting to, to hear you talk about that. And we, so, so the purpose of the circle was to keep him in school for the next three years. If you're looking at circles, you've got to get very, very clear about what you want them for, otherwise they just circle. Um, and so who, who was going to be the most powerful person to keep him in school was somebody who understood the school system and could broker the relationship. So we found an ex-principal, the principal of his old primary school, and asked him would he be on the circle and he took the role of principal to principal relationship and we never had another problem because every time there was a problem in the school the principal of the other school turned up and addressed it with the principal and resolved it. Um, this circle is over 10 years old now and it's still in place and still very very strong but of course you don't leave it at that point because we knew we had three years for this young man to be in school and then what? I find it very interesting that we wait until the last year of school and then ask the question what are you going to do um, when there's been no planning or preparation for that. This young man said to me very adamantly, very clear and he has never changed his uh, perception on this. I want to be a Catholic bishop. What are you going to do? <laughs> How easy would it be to say, get realistic, we could get your job pushing trolleys in the supermarket? And how many of us would do that? 
Do you know why? Because we don't know how to get to being with Kathy and Patricia. Not because it's not possible. Now, will it happen? Probably not. Because I don't think the church is quite ready for Al yet. Um, not because he couldn't be. But so how you work in an innovative model, there are some things that I have learned. Three probably really key points. If you're not the right person, don't try to do it. I say get the right duck caller for the role. Never ask a question that somebody can say no to. Think about that before you engage with people because if you open the opportunity for people to say no, that's exactly what they're going to do. And never abandon the hope or the dream for the person. So we knew this young man was coming up to leaving school. We knew he was... A, the other thing that I, that I always ask is who else cares? Who else would care about people entering the priesthood? Because that's where you start to identify who your allies are and you can go and, and draw them in. So in this situation, I was a reasonable duck caller for this role. I was kind of respectable and presentable and I understood the Catholic Church and I could <coughs> potentially manage a way into this role. Um, I had to sit down and think really carefully how I was going to ask questions that they couldn't say no to. And I had to say who else cares. And when you go through the who else cares, you, you go right through till you get to the top and that's where you stop. You know, never go to the oily rag if you can get to the mechanic. So who else cares? Well, the Catholic community in Auckland cares. They are short of priests and they need um, new entrance into the priesthood. The religious community in Auckland care. The seminary, there's a seminary in Auckland, they care. The bishop, he's the joker at the top, isn't he? So, okay, how do you go and talk to the bishop in a way that he can't say no? And this is about two and a half years, two, two years before Alex is ready to leave school. So I go to the bishop and um, knock on his door. And I ask him, could you tell me, what does the Catholic Church have to offer for young men who are school leavers who are interested in entering the priesthood? can't say no to that, can you? You have to give me an answer. And I got a, you know, I could just sit back, the world's your oyster, you know, uh, pretty much anything. So my next question is, what would you need from us to make those opportunities available to a young man who has an intellectual disability? You can't say no to that. Now to give him his due, he says, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> so I make the next appointment. And when I come back, he says, you know, I think he could clean my car. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I think he could. But you know, do you think he might be able to do this, 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 and this? To cut his long story short, he left school when he was 18 and went to work for the Bishop of Auckland as the assistant to the diocese of Auckland and the bishop didn't have a clue what he was going to do, but he gave him an office and a computer and an email address. Mm. And um, we have continued to work with the bishop now for over eight years, progressively getting... This, this photograph was taken about 18 months ago when his uh, role was... He was a principal server for funerals in the cathedral um, so, you know, the highest place in the church, right next to the bishop, and he served all religious funerals. So what you started to do was to get a young man seen as having a role that was of value in the church and recognised by other members of the church. He has just been accepted uh, beginning in next year's intake into the... Catholic Discipleship College in Auckland, which is a residential 12-month pre-seminary college. And at that point, we're looking at what ordained role 
Now, will he become bishop? I don't think so. Will he become an, a deacon? I think that's highly possible. And we had an interesting experience about two years ago, the Marist brothers. Because we've created a presence, the Marist brothers came and offered him a place in their community. And he was very, very excited. And Bishop Pat said, no, you are not going to take that, Alex. Look around you, they are a bunch of old men. What will your life be in that community? We have better things for you. So it takes time, but this is about being a partner in the life of this family. Now, Alex has an individualised funding package. I have to say his mother said to me when he was approached by the Marist, well, that will take care of all of our supported living issues. <laughs> um, how do we develop these relationships? The first thing we do is we do not employ staff. That, Alex has an individualised funding package, that's up to Alex and his family to employ the staff. We will pay the staff, we will train them, we will put their contracts together, we will make sure that they do what the family wants them to do. But if the family doesn't want us anymore, they don't need us. The family engage with us when they want something, not we are not in their lives on a constant basis, but as we develop through the vision to get to this place for Alex, then they engage with us. And we never say no. The only, we have two policies for the organisation. One is we cannot help you to engage in anything that is illegal. And we cannot help you or support you in any way that is abusive or neglectful. If you agree with those uh, policies, we will assist you. We also say to people, think very carefully about whether you want to engage in our service, because if you want the congregated, segregated lifestyle, there are lots of other people out there who can do that for you. But if you want your own lifestyle, then we'll walk with you on that journey and we'll get it right sometimes, and we'll get it wrong sometimes. Would you have a look at this? This is again, how do you do this? This young man is Robin. I met Robin when he was 20 years old. In a, his family, he was in a special school. His family had been connected to what was called a transition agency. They had one year to plan his transition from school. The mum said it took six months for the person to get to know who Robin was. And then he was given work experience opportunities and sheltered employment. And he was coming up to leave school. His dad came to me and said, can you help us? We cannot see any future for our son. And I found this very interesting. This, is a, this family, they were business people in Palmerston North, or they are business people in Palmerston North, they absolutely would do anything for their boy. And this is how I start. If you're thinking about innovation, go back to what could this life look like? My starting question is always, tell me about the person. I don't want to know about their disability. I don't want to know what they're, who they're not. I don't want to know who they, what they can't do. Tell me about the things that they love, that they're passionate about, that they're good at. What gets them up in the morning? 21 years they lived with this boy and they didn't know what to say. Nobody had asked them before. And the dad said, oh, you know, he really likes karaoke. And I thought, oh, well, I'm the wrong duck caller for that. <laughs> karaoke, I'm not quite sure where I'll take that, but anyway, we'll sit with it. His mum said, well, come and have a look at his bedroom. She said, he's 
fabulous at folding things and his clothes are always perfect and they're color coded and they're stacked size wise in the drawers she says I give him all the laundry when I get it in and he holds it for me so can you see now we've got a, a vision from that small step of a different life for Robin and I said to his dad do you think Robin could have his own business and he kind of absolutely impossible you know well do you know why because I had asked the wrong question so I reframed the question uh, what sort of support do you think Robin might need to have his own business and we could then start the conversation Robin has a laundry business Robin lives in his own home he has an individualized funding package he has no uh, paid supports now. He did have paid supports to start his laundry business because we needed to get it set up and he needed to learn all the skills. He has an upstairs uh, townhouse with um, a self-contained unit downstairs and two bedrooms upstairs. He has um, some university students who flat upstairs. He has his laundry downstairs. Now there were some problems in getting the laundry business started. One of the problems was he was only interested in doing towels. So that limited us a wee bit. And so what do you do? You have to say to yourself, okay, who has a demand for towels? And Robin now has a contract laundry business. He has six hairdressers and an art studio. And they are all within walking distance of his apartment in Palmerston North. Now we had another problem was Robin would return the wrong towels to the wrong place and if the hairdressers got the art studio towels they weren't all that happy about. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, the strategy we have now is every hairdresser has their own colour and he has coloured plastic bags to match and so that's very simply sorted. And he now walks himself and delivers the laundry and puts it up every day. So you can see how he now has a presence. He just before Christmas, his dad and, um, took a membership for him in the local chamber of commerce because he says he's been in business here now for four years. He should be part of the business community. We had an incident about two years ago uh, with Robin. His dad rang me up and said Robin was hit by a car to live in his laundry. And I, I smiled at myself at my reaction. My first reaction was not, oh, is he okay? It was, oh my God, what's Nancy gonna say now? Nancy's his mum. She'll stop everything. Then my second thing was, is Robin okay? Um, and Robin was okay. He was on a pedestrian crossing. An older driver didn't slow down in time, hit him, and he was not badly hurt, but he was shaken. And I said to Lawrence, what are you going to do? And this is the dad. He said, you know, we made a mistake. We taught Robin that you, when the little man went green, you could cross. Now we're teaching him when the little man goes green, you look left and right. Um, now, if you look at that in terms of a system, we would have risk management reporting right through to government for something like that and people would be considered not to have road sense and couldn't cross the road safely by themselves and we would very quickly cut down and restrict all of the relationships that uh, he could have and then need paid supports again. Two of the assumptions that we work on that we believe lead people to different lives are two of the assumptions I think that underpin the service system. Underpinning the service system is a belief that disabled people can only live with other disabled people. We don't believe that's true and we don't believe that there is any evidence to say that it is true and with the people we support nobody lives with other disabled people. They do live with other people and with a range of other people. We have one young man in our system who for the last four years has been operating a backpackers. 
Now, the reason he's operating a backpackers is he has his own home, he has his own individualised funding package, he had university students <coughs> sharing with him. He grew out of university students. He didn't want this type of a flatmate anymore, he was getting too old for it. Mm -hmm. We had to sit down with his mum and say, you know, if he didn't have a disability, what would be the next step in his life? And his mum said he'd go on his OE. That's what all these university students do. We couldn't quite figure out how we were going to do that. So we said, let's bring the OE to him. Started advertising on the Backpackers websites. People sign up for three months. They spend three months in Andrew's house. He has two backpackers at a time. And he has a wait list. What's an OE? Over, overseas experience, it's a New Zealand expression. Oh. <laughs> then we go on on his own, couldn't do that. Um, we know the backpackers are starting to wear sin now. Um, he's had enough of these uh, people coming through his life, so we are now in the process of planning what is his next um, business going to be. But this is what people call innovation. I don't think it's innovation. I think it is about starting with the person asking what they want their life to look like, thinking about how you're going to do that, and shaping it up in a way that is as ordinary as you can possibly get it. And just to finish, I just want to show you a little DVD about what this makes possible in people's lives. Um, I met Mark in 1994 at, at church and I've been a friend of him ever since. In 2001 I spent six months in India uh, working as a doctor there and I really enjoyed um, the, the culture and my time there. And on returning I had the idea that it would be good if, if uh, Mark wished to travel to India that I would um, help him to do that given his disabilities, that he would need help. It wasn't my idea to go to the slums of India to visit the World Vision children. It was Mark's idea. But I was very happy to accompany him uh, and to help him. I'm planning to go to India to see my three World Vision kids. My World Vision children I'm uh, between four and sixty years old. I sell chocolate um, on the side of the road for my kids. How many chocolate bars do you think you've uh, sold to? Ten, ten thousand. So how long have you been taking for this day? I, over about a year. A year. Well, he didn't actually need um, a doctor. His uh, condition is stable. He just needed somebody who had been to India before and who um, was able to help him with his, his care. He needed at least two caregivers. So I really went in the capacity of a caregiver. Just with the wheelchair, it can be quite difficult with accessibility. Uh, slums and project areas aren't necessarily, necessarily set up and uh, he, we're not able to get the wheelchair in there. How is it? Um, yeah, it's, it's not too far but the track there is very narrow. Yep. Some places there, there's nowhere to stand. In India, we couldn't take the big electrical chair where Mark usually gets around using his chin on an electrical um, steering device. 
that was far too heavy for the plane and for the uneven streets. I'll never forget this. Uh, yeah, uh, because. <laughs> you are, you are all very vicious to my heart. Mark, of course, has been excited about this trip for a number of years, uh, and so the actual time where he met the families was hugely exciting for him. It was very exciting for him. Uh, therefore, the whole process and the difficulty even in getting there into some of those places was exciting for him. When the family saw Mark, they were, of course, excited to see the person who had been uh, donating the money and supporting the community. They were also, in some ways, very curious about this young man who was in a wheelchair uh, and obviously had quite severe disabilities. There were lots of questions about his life. I'm really happy for what I am doing because, uh, because um, the Lord's really placed it on my heart to go. Love is stronger than life. The final part was, that was the final step in his journey. He was very pleased to be able to see the children that he'd been sponsoring. <laughs> Are you okay, Hannah? Uh, this, this year we gave to them all the sponsor children. I'm very happy. And this is Akash. Uh, yeah. He's asking me, how are you? themselves this cannot be done it was done and if we want lives like Mark Mark has, is currently supporting six children from selling chocolate he is relentless you cannot walk down Broadway without being you know, accosted he won't use any of that money to support his own um, visits he's since visited Africa to visit um, the communities there. He's written a book to do that called The Chocolate Cell of Broadway. Um, that's available online. And he's also d uh, made a DVD on, on The Chocolate Cell of Broadway. So he's supplementing his, he's, he lives on a, a, a benefit. He's settled for that. He's, he would like a job. Um, we haven't mastered that yet. So he engages himself in these other activities. I think one of the dangers we have now is that because Mark's time is full, we will, and that getting the job is hard, it's going to be easy for us to see the poor, the one that's got no four of his um, real hopes up. I think the other thing that I have learned is you, you can take breaks. You, sometimes, Families need a break, 
sometimes the person themselves need a break and sometimes you need a break in terms of the ability to keep pushing things forward. The key is that you don't settle for it. Every life is a new service. That's a principle of becoming a leader. Thank you for your comments on innovation. I find them very inspirational, Lorna. We're very fortunate that uh, you can be with us. Thank you. Comments built upon a lifetime of authenticity. Thank you. Some of the feedback we got from the last forum was that people said, oh, but they would like to have more conversation with the speaker. <laughs> So I just sort of wondered if you might just like to reflect on what you've heard and then maybe if Lorna comes back out just at this stage, uh, we could just begin a dialogue uh, with Lorna and uh, maybe that would take us through to uh, morning tea and then morning tea and then we'll start the questions as planned. But maybe just a little reflection between one another on something that struck you <laughs> and is there any burning question that's come from your particular table that could open up a little conversation uh, with Lorna and uh, we might just graph uh, this conversation the well, conversation responses Emma but I think she's just left the room um, okay so just quick quick chat amongst oneself and then we'll invite Lorna to uh, respond uh, we might begin, my suggestion is that Lorna, if uh, you wouldn't mind just moving, standing near each table and the table will raise a question and uh, you don't need to be microphone, Sam believes that he can pick it up by uh, just you moving around. So if we could have uh, one table that might just like to engage Lorna in uh, the first sort of dialogue. Uh, just a little conversation coming out of Lorna's presentation. Uh, Chris, is it you? Okay, so thanks, Chris. Uh, Lorna, I was really pleased that you, you, you talked about the fact of engaging families yeah. around sort of how they see their son or daughter, because that, that's obviously yeah. one of the, I think is one of the critical yeah. issues um, around yeah. sort of how successful you can be. Um, one of the questions I've got is the, obviously the examples that you talk about, you've, you've got a, a fairly long involvement with with those those people and their families, and um, how critical is it? And sorry, probably two questions. How critical is it to have that um, length of contact and understanding? Because obviously, the goals aren't achieved overnight. They take many years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm assuming that sort of it is fairly critical. But then, who is given that we work within an environment where key staff could change over, change roles, move on. Um, I'm not too sure, like you're obviously in ACT, but do you still maintain contact with those families? So it's how, how do you actually maintain the continuity when key, key members are actually changing, changing their roles and or moving on? Um, I, I think that's, it's interesting. I mean, you, you saw Mark with his um, supporters. Uh, well, one of the, the young Maori woman who was with him, she, there are two people who have worked with Mark, they've worked with Mark for 10 years. As the support staff, they've not changed. I think some of what we create is an environment that people want to be in. It is critical to be with families. You can't ask families to do this all by themselves. Um, you can't ask families to have all of that resource. However, the way we engage with them is equal solid. So we are aware of things might be coming up to a change. We need to just be checking in with those families. I was just saying, had a, talking to a family just before I left, because yes, my leaving has not been an easy thing for a lot of families. And one of the families was kind of concerned about that, and I said, what do you think I've done? You think back over the last 12 months, what have I done? She said, you've just been there. I've known you at the end of the phone. Um, 
one of the things that we're very, very clear about is we don't create a dependency. Um, we give families the skills and resources that they need and we build circles so that we are not the people that they are in constant need of. If there comes to a change of staff, that's usually when they come back to us. If things are foundering and they can't make progress, they come back to us. But anybody who participates in the network, in the Imagine Better Network, is there for as long as they want to be there. So to me, then, would, would the role of this, the circle of support be more inf more important to have continuity and this, the staff, for whatever better word, are the implementers of whatever the person wants, but it's the circle of support that's critical. The circle of support's very, very important um, because that's the personal set of relationships and those people are not bound by anything. They can, you know, what services can't do, the circle of support can do, um, because they are not bound by risk things or compliance things or, um, we don't insist on anything, but we try to encourage all of the people who are part of our network to have a seat and to think about, um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a formal circle, I'm thinking of one man that's in our network, he's He's a man with Alzheimer's, but he's developed Alzheimer's in his early 50s. And his wife um, came to us very concerned about him losing all connection with people he worked with, and he's a rugby player. And, and he's got a circle, and if you said to the guys in the circle that they were a circle <laughs> of support, they'd run a mile, you know? So you really have to think about what is it that what are the sets of relationships that we're trying um, to support? We support that circle. It's um, we support it, and the his sister, the man's sister, supports it. And essentially, it's a group of four men who used to meet with Greg every, or still do, every Friday night at the rugby club, um, and they watched rugby and they drank and they bet on the horses and things like that. And they still do that. But what we started to do was to go, or the sister started it, um, to say she would go on a Friday night and take one of us once a month and buy the pizza and the round for the guys and say things like, do you know Greg hasn't played around the golf for a month, but do you know anybody who might feel like a couple of them at the week for games and they would organise it or did you know a group sleeping and so they'd get a work and be together. Now that circle's probably about four years old. They say to us, did you know that this is not happening or this is happening <laughs> or we're going to organise that and um, one of the things the family had been struggling with was the need, he lives quite rurally, to get him into town because of transport and, and of course he's not selling but the guys are. So we, we've convinced him we know how to sell ourselves and we're going to go and paint <laughs> and do it up for him and, and so there's a circle that's just informally held together but are now taking a approach. Maybe instead yeah. of a circle you can call them a seeing their rugby players you can call them the type five. Or something <laughs> like that. No, it's a, yeah, type yeah. five. But it, it is about being I think deeply thoughtful. Uh, and one strategy is not going to be the strategy that's going to work. The, the concept might, but the strategy is going to have to be different. We've got another circle, um, which we term the pub crawl circle. They meet with a man who's severe, who suffered a severe brain injury on a motorbike, um, and they were all old motorbike mates. And every Saturday afternoon, they get on their bikes and they go to a different pub, and they come round and, and pick him up. But they, they have a circle who's organised themselves online and they've done a really um, a neat thing. They've put up a calendar and what they've decided is that he needs somebody doing something with them every day and so the calendar goes up online and people fill in and there's a, the, a person within the circle is taking the coordinator's role and will email people and say, Michael's not got anything on Thursdays. 
does anybody know anybody or available to do something on a Thursday? Um, we really have very little engagement at the moment. That then we can just watch online. Sure. <coughs> you may move on. <laughs> so maybe if we uh, just take a look here. on top of that I guess mm. um, because I can imagine you have quite a complex um, group of people and circle of friends etc so I just kind of wanted to know how you make that work. We've got a couple of mechanisms. We, we, uh, we imagine being is not, is not a funded organisation um, so people essentially sign up with us. We have a little um, thing that's called Partners in Lifestyle Design and people decide how much support they need or think they might need to find us, and we sign up to them. What we generally say is if they're on an individualised funding package, often people are, when they go on an individualised funding package, they're a bit weary about how far the money's going to go. Um, actually, it's an interesting thing that we've found people who, have, who get less money than they need, we get better outcomes for them, let's just say that, um, because they're more dependent on being in the ordinary world than, than not. And so it's quite hard to get people to commit when they're not sure how far their money will go. So that we work with them and help them to think about what they might need. And then we say to them, well, look, let's work together for six months. And we'll just keep a track of how many hours we use. And then we, we can see if we've got it right or not. You can do a wash up at the end of the year and see if he's gone over and then we can renegotiate. Um, so we do that. And then in our agreement with the family is they will be in touch with us whenever they need anything. Um, and it doesn't actually matter whether it's over their allotted hours or not. We just keep a note of that. <coughs> What's happened as people have got used to individualised funding, in the first year we, that people are on it, we usually find they seriously underestimate the amount of time that it takes. But if we say it's okay, we'll work with you anyway, it takes a lot of those anxieties from those um, concerns that Shirley was raising. We have also found that for the majority of people on individualised funding, they have a surplus of their end. Um, and they, they have started now paying for a match of better services in advance. And their kind of attitude is, look, if we don't use a lot of money, we're going to go back to the office anyway. So you guys might just have it. That gives us a little bit of capacity there to meet this. And yet sometimes we're completely overwhelmed because the work is very intensive. Other times we might not hear from the family for 18 months. So does that make it difficult to extend your service to new? And I guess that's what I'm getting at. Because if you don't know what your future is going to be as far as providing that support, because that's been driven by the individual and the family, how do you then reconcile with... The way we've operated is with what we call, we have a series of, of what we call Imagine Better Associates, because Imagine Better works with Costly and Learn, um, of really key people that we've worked with over the years, we know how skilled they are, we sign them up as associates so that they're available to us if we need somebody and we have got the resources. Thank you. All right, I'm going to sit at the back table. <laughs> One of the issues um, I, I raised was uh, your point on about um, only engaging with those people who are enthusiastic, spending time, spending time and energy with the naysayers. And I think I was just reflecting on, on our journey so far at Northcott. Uh, have, mm -hmm. you know, there's a few people who go, oh, but I can't do this, and uh, what's your point? Mm -hmm. But that, that's some of them. And the other ones are, you know, really want to embrace it. Really, I was just saying, wow. It's not that you abandon other people. Is it? it's, it's, it's not. Some people just simply fall into the category of what I call the deeply reluctant. Well, you yeah. can spend your whole life with the yeah. deeply reluctant. Yeah. Um, I love that one. Mm. Right. <laughs> and in fact, the deeply reluctant tend to come on when they see yes. the, the progress of others. Yeah. Um, and so 
So you guys become the white swans. And I think there becomes a tipping point where people start to say, actually, this kind of life is wrong. Uh, we're not at that yet by any stretch of the imagination. But yeah, we invest very heavily in the deeply reluctant because they seem to be the most um, vociferous in their kind of in it, the way they take out. Um, well, we were fortunate to have Lorna sitting with us, so yeah, <laughs> we've already had a bit of a discussion. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, what, one thing that just struck me well, out of the many things that I think the who else cares one, I mean, that seems to really powerfully build a, a context and a, um, a network, mm. I think, too, and, and as you're saying, the word allies, and, and um, so it, it's, it becomes the person within their broader system, doesn't it? And, and opportunities then that can, can happen which lead to the next question and so it just seemed very powerful. That, uh, I think there's <coughs> another strategy we use and it, it, it um, goes back in some ways to the deeply right one, but these people aren't necessarily... Even the, even the very engaged have anxieties and the yes but, yes but, what, what about this, what about this, what about this? What we say to, to, to disabled people and families is everything <coughs> that you're concerned about, write it down. Everything, we want to know every anxiety you have, every risk that you think, just put them in a list and we will work with you systematically to get a safeguard alongside of each of your concerns and anxieties. We say they won't be perfect, no safeguard is foolproof, but have we got <coughs> the safeguard to a point where you think, yep, we can run with it? Um, so it means you're really hearing those things for a start, mm -hmm. doesn't it? And you're then not you're dismissing it. No. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because they're real yeah. for the people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Lorna, for further insight and real life experience. What I think we might do now is break and have morning tea just slightly earlier ahead of time. And then we'll come back and look at the innovation questions. Maybe Lorna might move around table to table while the discussion's going on, so you've got more chance to uh, reflect with Lorna. So, shall we come back around about, you know, quarter to 11, 10 to 11? There's uh, morning tea there, and uh, we do invite you to go out onto the deck. I think uh, the sun's up today, so uh, take a little break. So, thank you. Conversations with Bishop Hi, everyone. Uh, just a quick uh, bit of housekeeping before we get started again. Uh, remember I told you about the lift that gets stuck halfway? Well now we have toilets that you can get trapped in apparently. There's a door that you don't close that, not the door of the toilet, you can close that one, but there's a door in the hallway, don't close that one, somebody did. Uh, so the risk management strategy is take your mobile phone with you if you're going to toilet that way. If you do, you won't, but if you do, then yeah, okay, there you go. I'll hand over to Trisha. Okay, folks. We'll make a start when we're ready to roll. Uh, but in making a start, could I just draw your attention to the handout that Trish gave out as you came in? Uh, at the next breakfast, we're fortunate to have Stephen Stirk with us. And as you know, Stephen Stirk is the first, or first author on the book, Creating Person-Centred Organisations. And he's a family member. He has a daughter in her, I think, mid-twenties. And uh, he worked for Response United, or United Response in the UK. So he's got a lot of experience. And so apart from talking at the breakfast, if you actually have got one of these at your table, could I invite you to open it? So it's the green, just have one of these in your hand. I think there's a couple just there. I'm going to uh, work with him on these uh, two days, mainly just to support the facilitation. Uh, and he's going to work these exercises around what's in the book. So creating a person-centered culture his background's human resources, he's a family member, he's worked for this large organisation on helping the organisation change its culture. He'll then look at what's leadership, 
using person-centered tools. The tools that some of you have met within our champions training will be used within these two days to show how you can use them at an organizational level. Uh, developing individual service funds, there's just um, some exercises in the book around funding. But on the second uh, day, it's working together for change. Uh, he's a great believer in that not one sector of a large organization can make change. You've got to get everybody working together. He'll look at human resource management and he'll also look at teamwork. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of the work that he's prepared to date. It's very accessible. And so rather than just have him at the breakfast, coming from the UK is a long way to come just for the breakfast. These are just two days. They've got a day in between. So you may want to consider sending some of your staff to both days, or you may prefer to send some to day one or day two. And um, it's $175 a day, but for family members and people with disabilities, it's $50. So I'm just wanting to promote that with you because uh, I'm now getting to know him. And I think um, for some of those questions about the challenge that we've had today about uh, working um, in a way that uh, you can um, not just have a package um, to be there just for what's been offered in the past, but now the person themselves the fund holder, but there's not much to choose from. Uh, working together for change is this person's emphasis, and I think you'd get a lot out of it. So um, I hope some people will respond and. If you don't come yourself, send staff. Um, and if you want to send more than one staff and you think you'd like to do a deal with me around the price, I'm always open to that too. So, the questions today. The first question you can see up there is, uh, what is the story about your organization that you hear yourself most often telling? And what could the new story look like? So in view of what we've heard today, I think uh, there are some, um, suggestions of maybe that the story we are holding on to could move in a different direction. So if I could have somebody to be the facilitator and somebody to take the notes and somebody to record back, um, we'll spend about five to ten minutes on this and uh, you'll give feedback which Emma will grab. Thanks very much. I just want to tell you that today we'll stay at the same table. We won't move. Lorna will move, if that's okay. So um, we're just about ready for the feedback, Sam, getting the cameras sorted. Can we take um, your table first, maybe, Liz? Any feedback? Just Sam will tell you when to roll. Okay. Um, what we looked at is the cultural change, um, and I suppose both of our organizations, if they are to be counted, um, have said that they sort of feel they are the starting blocks. There's ways of, of managing that. Um, um, Northcott has a newsletter which has engaged um, people um, to be able to tell their story and, and, and their journey. The need to um, use new language um, in talking about um, the, you know, the story that, that um, or the journey. Um, basically, we talked about um, how people have been had managed lives and, and changing from that sort of being um, from being separate and to a managed life, and now our, our, our focus is on shared um, sort of living, so that that there are that there are natural supports in place, and the circle of support is people that that are not paid, but people that are naturally part of that person's life. Good, so uh, we've got a lot there of, uh, was, was there anything um, about, did people talk about how they felt about the story that they tell about the organization, or was it mainly more the second part, of what could the new story look like? Uh, probably I was in we didn't really talk about the old, you know, I yeah. think the, it, we sort of touched on that and then it was more um, how so often that it's all about the past and the history 
and that we actually have to move respect up. that and move forward. Okay, and, great. Yeah, good. rather than so from manage deliberate. To mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> this table here, Megan, I don't know if somebody's feeding back. Uh, was there any Thanks, comment Megan. on the story about the long? Did okay. anybody comment on the stories that they like to hang on to, and then yeah. what could the new story be? Oh, the system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, I think the the main um, point that we all shared was we talk about our systems, so we're constantly okay. looking at the risk, the systems, as opposed to, as Megan and David pointed out, the individual. So how can we talk about the strengthening the system? We. Um, as opposed to focusing on the individual. We do talk about meeting the individual needs, um, and I can't read that. What about you? It's been operational. Okay, and attaching to operational, committing to the person. <laughs> I don't quite no. know about that. Operational needs. Okay, so basically we do talk about the in individual, but not so much in the person-centered approach. Is that right? Mm. Megan. Um, <laughs> um, no, we certainly do, but um, I think sometimes our starting point can be more focused on the funding um, and the system and that, that we're actually operating in, rather than the actual end Indi goal and, and as the individual. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, actually we do talk about responding to the legislations and our funding requirement as a body, which I think is completely different, Lorna, to where you start off from your service, because you don't actually have those kind of constraints. Um, as opposed to, as I said, to the individual who should be the first focus. Um, and we were looking at new paradigms of a board, so a new board, a board that's not governed with the you know, legislation so much, but looking at solutions driven for the Okay, resident. that's great. So it's a combination of the sort of things that you hear yourself talking about, which is funding and systems, and the new story could look like, well, a more um, flexible board, <laughs> well, we think that the the presentation from Lorna has, at this table, really moved us. Yeah, I uh, agree. Uh, has taken the concept of understanding uh, uh, person-centered, for one of yes. a better word, and I think it's inadequate, um, to a different level altogether. Yeah. Uh, we're nowhere near there. Yes, or, yes. You know, like we're a bit overwhelmed, yeah. to be honest with you. Sure, sure. And, so it's um, a different starting point. Yeah, it is, certainly. Yeah. And we love the fact that um, Warner's organisation is outside funding because as soon as you have a covenant related to <coughs> government funding, then you have a whole bunch of constraints that get tied up with that and get compromised, actually. Okay. And uh, so that's uh, as a freedom uh, which I... Uh, can I tell a story, a little story? Yesterday, this is yesterday, uh, um, CEOs across New South Wales were invited to come out performance in inverted commas by Dewa to attend a meeting. And we went into the city and they had tele, it was across Australia actually, they had teleconference with Townsville, Melbourne, and other places. And um, Megan will verify for this because I came back really angry. And uh, so Dewa did the Dewa thing. So there's a room full of 30 di dis disability employment service providers in the room, and they just bullied us. They, there's no other way of describing what they did. You know, they were saying that um, you you either perform or you're out, and we're going to measure you, and we're going to give your business away. And and I came out thinking we do a, we have a des uh, program that's about a million dollars, and in actual fact, in, in Insisting that the CEO be there was rubbish because it was actually all operational and programmatic and the CEO should be doing other stuff. So they've got an uh, elevated view of their own importance. And I kind of felt, felt that for a million dollars, you'd say, well, okay, give your desk program to somebody else that really wants it because this is rubbish. And I, I didn't use the word rubbish, but um, I just was appalled. You know, and this is yesterday. We're, we're supposed to be operating in a different paradigm of understanding between NGOs and government and all of this, but it was just heavy-handed, bullying the uh, uh, NGOs, and uh, and people were generally speechless, I felt anyway. So it was just an appalling experience. So, so, that's I think, I think so we've got a lot of stuff yeah. to And that's what I think Darren was sort of saying, you know, like the government, government uh, 
like it's a small funding, but if you, as soon as you put in the system, and obviously, and Dee is actually one of the candidates for sort of running the, the new NDIS. Yeah. So, um, and I, I know, I know, I know what you've, what, what you've experienced that sort of interesting relationship with Dee with around deserts before. So there's no new story to tell for mm. Dee Wah. Um, can we go to this table? Oh, no, I've not been there. Can we go to this table? So, um, so the old, the old stories. Some old um, stories versus the new stories. Well, I mean, again, um, I think it's it's the the, the, the challenge, especially from an organisational and, and, and a staff perspective, of the letting go mm -hmm. to enable those choices to lead to to the opportunities. Um, and. Um, uh, was picked up on and on Lorna's sort of idea of identifying the worries, but like Lorna was talking about sort of probably for the family what their worries were, but that's not such a bad thing to do for um, for an organisation to go through with their staff and their management and board. Um, like I've got out my strategic planning review next next week, and I'm sort of thinking, I know I know my organisation is going to sort of say we should be focusing on growth, and um, and I'm going to be trying to sort of say look that may not necessarily be the the, the future in, in it's sort of how we actually provide growth of opportunities rather than growth in numbers of people or dollars or whatever so that's sort of got, got to get my head around the um the list of worries that the board might have um, the the question of the old story is are we ready moving to being at least ready for something and for a start um, and um I think the uh, the issue was that a lot of organisations sort of think that that might it all happen just in one big go, like a big bang. But in reality, there's been a lot of change happening gradually um, and more sort of in, in, in an evolving way. Um, I suppose um, it's also focusing on what you think your um, your relationships or your strong relationships are at present with the individuals and the families and then, then having a conversation with them. So, so starting from where you think your strength is. Okay, so that's a new story leading to individuals and families. Great. Emma, are we ready to feedback? I think so. Um, so there's a lot of common things that we've amongst all the tables. Um, a feeling that there is a need for new stories and those stories are going to be about shared lives, not managed lives. At the moment, sometimes the stories are about the funding and about the systems instead of being about the individuals and that's not all that person-centred. Um, so there's a feeling that it's time to shift the starting point of the group's thinking and with that you may have the growth of opportunities rather than um, the growth of the organisation. And that also ties in with what people were saying about um, the need for boards and um, I guess other management structures to think and grow um, and finally it is important to respect the past and move forward but letting go might be challenging which I think leads to the next question. Great, thank you very much Emma. So stay at the same tables and Lorna will move to another table and uh, what will you and your team have to let go to uh, find the starting point or to uh, move into the new story? So what will your team have to let go? Your team could be the management team, it could be the board, or whatever. Okay, we started with Megan's table first. Maybe, Liz, can we start with your table this time? This is just, uh, what will your team have to let go to move from the old to the new story? Thanks. Oh, okay, 
that's right. So we had also something that we need to let go is we want to get it right first time. And actually, that's, <laughs> that's, really, uh, that's not realistic. And instead of aiming for getting it right first time, that's learning from our mistakes and reflecting on that and improving next time. So that kind of in incremental improvement. And our final discussion was about letting go of all the massive policies and procedures oh, yeah. that legally, I mean, as, you know, as, as David's outlined, you know, we get paid at the moment for having to apply uh, to a huge amount of, um, well, certainly 10 standards, but, you know, underneath all of those are a, a huge range of policies and procedures that are barely understandable by ourselves, let alone our workers and the people that we support. And over the break, somebody said, I think it might have been yourself, but you know, Lorna mentioned one of your organisations just had two major policy. Yeah. So thanks very much, Liz. So can we come to this table? What are you going to let go and move from the old to the new story? Um, I think in some ways the, one of the big challenges is the, the existing service models. So right. letting go of the existing service models and, and what, uh, what are the models that replace those? Then there was also talk about that some some of the models that um, organisations have established have always usually come from trying to address you know, um, good things, and so the models in themselves isn't it's not a um, it's not an issue of the components of models. It's either they're in or they're out, or you let them go totally, or you you know there's there's you actually there's there's components of models that actually are quite um, reflective of where. You, and it can be responsive to where you want to point them. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the, the the biggest thing would be letting go of the assumption by staff that they have the answers to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, and that's that actually creates a bit of a pressure for staff that they sort of feel that they've got to, to know everything or they've got to be able to respond to every every request and or issue that um, may be raised by the individual mm -hmm. and family. Um, and letting go of that being safe, because uh, again we create structures and policies and procedures to make us feel like we're we're responding, but mm -hmm. it's actually we're being we're creating an environment of being safe. Mm -hmm. So it's probably moving towards being more anxious, more unsure, and more unknowing. <laughs> so um, and then letting go of a needs-based uh, approach, but again uh, I suppose a needs-based is, is reflective of the system that we've all come to know. And, and being involved in where you actually have, have a need to then create, get a resource to then, then respond. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, what have you got experience coming from that list around the table? That's great. Thanks a lot. And uh, we're winding up back here. Who's going to get the list? Um, we talk pretty much with the same um, kind of themes. So basically, letting go of the current system that we know, so the current way that we are providing service provision. Um, we need to let go of the what ifs and again take some gambles and um, and open ourselves to risk because it's the only way we'll be innovative. So let go of the past that we know the best mentality, what is, you know, we know what is best for the resident. And as David pointed out, let go of the sense that people with dis the disability are simply participants as opposed to people that are actually living lives on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, in essence, what we talked about. Really good. I can remember years ago I was working in an organisation and the guy that ran the organisation, I would report to him and I would go and I would have an issue and I really wanted somebody to discuss it with, but he was socialised into believing that in his role as the head of the organisation he had to have the answer. It took me months to work out what used to go on in these conversations. I'd rock up thinking, oh, I'm going to talk about this. I go out the door with, well, this is the way it's got to be. But he, he wasn't an authoritarian man. But I think what he thought was that as a CEO, if anybody came to him with anything, he had to tell them the answer. No, no, he's just, he was just a bloke and he needed to fix it. That's right. <laughs> 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 had nothing to do with the CEO. I just had to fix it. Well, I know that you're not a bloke like that. Well, you're you're a good fix anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Um, okay, so one of the big things that needs to be let go is 
um, sticking to existing service models. Um, for example, um, using the needs-based approach before you design the services that you provide. Having said that, it doesn't mean that they're all bad and there are definitely some components that could remain. Um, agencies need to let go of their power around decision making. Um, so rather than knowing all the answers, they need to become facilitators and help the people that they support to come up with their own decisions um, and direct their own lives. And that includes staff assumptions and anxieties around um, providing all the answers. So it's all about remembering that the people that we support are living their lives, they're not participating in a program or a service. It's okay not to get it right the first time, that's a big anxiety. Um, policies, procedures, risk, safety, all of those things, um, it seems need to be let go to some extent, um, because in order to innovate, you need to open yourself up to risk. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks a lot, Emma. It was great reporting back. Well, this is the, the last question. Um, so I'm leaving here today in terms of the discussion that you've had in terms of listening to Lauren's presentation. Uh, what are the first steps uh, that you might take uh, to using the gifts of your team? Because innovation is about recognising gifts as well. So you might each have a first step or there might be a consensus first step. So um, after that, Lauren will reflect on our responses and then once again, Folks, this is the last feedback now, and uh, first steps, I can see that uh, Emma's got a big space up there just for us to put some in. So can we start with your table first, Chris? Okay. Um, so when we're going to um, leave here today, the gifts of our team, well I suppose it's uh, the one thing that, that each of us has been doing is, is going back and sharing the knowledge. Yeah. Um, okay. Because I suppose in some ways it's be useless if we didn't. Um, and I was sort of saying that I, I actually, um, I had a, a staff member on my exec team who's very good at um, her background's in academic, she's got a PhD, she loves to read stuff, good. which are all the skills that I haven't got. So I actually just give her the book, uh, the booklet, Sam, the books that you give me, and I say, can you go away and read these and summarise them in a way that our staff will understand. Oh, very good. Well, you so, might like to flip that back to us, too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call them accessible copy. That's what I said. That's a lucky man. Because <laughs> yeah. if they had to wait for me to read the book, it would be five years. Um, so taking back the, uh, the examples and stories from the conversations is, is always a good way of um, articulating the concepts uh, for people who weren't in the room. Um, sharing the new thinking uh, of what's, what is happening. Uh, and what's been what's been done in different locations, um, whether it be in Australia or overseas or New Zealand. Um, Try to, I suppose, in the conversation, shift and challenge sort of the paradigm of why why we're doing things. But sometimes we just do it because it's been done, so we just never actually ask the question of is it still relevant now to to what it was. It might have been relevant at the time when we when we did it that way. Um, identifying the different talents of the team. It's probably also giving them a, a safe environment to discuss an experiment, because if you don't give them a safe environment to discuss an experiment, they're not going to actually feel they can do the same thing with families and individuals. Uh, just start small, uh, one example at a time. And reframing questions are, are really, really good if you want to continue a conversation. Closed ended questions are really good if you want to just want to shut it down. Mm -hmm. And they're both both those things, both mm -hmm. those sort of mm -hmm. types of questions do have a relevance somewhere. Great. Good. Thanks very much. A rich list. <laughs> okay, shall we come over here? Um, they've nominated me uh, to do this and I'm gonna start with the last thing first, I think. Um, Sounds very spiritual. Because um, <laughs> it became apparent that the gifts of the team we're talking about the people, that the people who have worked in our organisation, many for a long time, and there's no doubting their buy-in to what we do and their sense of belief in what they do and the sense of commitment to, uh, to the work that they do. So we want to tap into those gifts to ensure that they're not lost. And, uh, and in fact, built upon all 
moved around to actually change direction if need be or change manner um, and, uh, and so on. But I, I was at a thing with Della Bosca on Tuesday and he was asked a question from the guys in the audience which were not related to this sector saying under NDIS are you going to have sufficient people to actually provide support to all the people that are going to tap into um, uh, intermediate their need? And he just said no we're not. So the people issue becomes a looming crisis point. So we find it hard now, hard enough now to maintain our FTEs, our numbers. So with a new paradigm, that's even going to be harder. So the people that we have in our sector are our goal, and we need to tap into their gifts and put a lot of effort into getting them to understand the kind of things that we've been talking about today. Okay. Um, person-centred planning starting point, real person-centred planning, such that we've been exposed to today. Lauren, thank you. Engage our leadership groups in our organisations and tap into their gifts of understanding and commitment and experience. Um, managing change in that regard. Knowing how to deliver to the right people what they need. What can we live with? what is reasonable and what's an acceptable risk. This was Lorna chiming in with some discussion about our adherence to understanding <coughs> and, and, and managing risk. And Lorna actually said, well, you've still got to do that because you've still got duty of care and you still have responsibilities as organisations, as employers, so that doesn't go out the window. Uh, so all those things are still valid, which was really good because we were a little bit in a different place was anyway a little while ago um, and the gifts of the team so yeah okay. cool Great. anything else yeah. guys we got it we got it mate yeah. thanks, We've done it. thanks a lot David Sorry. and the table this table mm, yep yeah. um, so within our within our group we discussed um, that one of the gifts our teams have a is a voice yes um, so we discussed about like celebrating that voice and not shutting them off having that say and stuff. Um, sort of things that have been overlapped before. And we discussed about sharing stories, um, collaborating with families, which is really important. And then by doing that, like showing them real concrete examples. Mm -hmm. um, even just examples that we picked up from today from Lorna and mm -hmm. last week with My Place and really just showing think, like even my family to start with. Yes. Just like, <laughs> hey, these guys are doing this in their life, so sort of thing, so. Thanks very much, Ben. So, um, Emma, what have we got there? Okay, so, um, one of the first steps is sharing the knowledge and new thinking that you've all um, developed and continue to develop from coming to the breakfast conversations. Um, for example, giving information to the right person so that your information can become accessible to the rest of the organisation. Um, challenge each other and ask questions to create a safe environment to experiment, and that includes considering risk and what actually is an acceptable risk in the context of your organisation and the work that you do. Um, asking open questions, not closed questions. Tapping into existing gifts and building upon them. Um, so the emphasis there is on the existing staff members, helping um, put a lot of effort into their understanding of all of these new concepts um, and the information. Celebrating our voices. Um, and sharing stories and real life examples with people in the workplace, um, the people that you support, and families. Thanks very much, Emma, and thanks very much for the great graphic that you've done of the whole day. Yeah. So, we've got a quarter of an hour now just to finish up. So, uh, Lorna will give us some reflection and then we'll finish with Ben and Shirley. So, we'll start racing through. So, thanks, Lorna. I don't know if it's easy for you to come up here. So um, it's just such a very interesting and challenging discussion, isn't it? Because, um, in fact, you get the sense that you kind of in a place where kind of monumental change is possible, and can we can we grasp it? And can we grasp it without essentially? It's a bit like trying to turn the Titanic with a full head of steam on. Can we do that without tipping it over? And I think that's some of the cautions, and, and um, very rightfully some of the cautions, because 
I don't think everything is doable at all times. And some of this is really about how do we, um, how do we begin to turn the rudder so that ultimately we're turning in another direction and that we're confident about that and we're secure about that and um, we've got our processes and systems in place because you, some of what you see when people um, try to engage in change without being too thoughtful about it is you can often abandon people to bad choices and you know I mean there's a lot of this uh, almost not taking responsibility for people when they make choices even though you know they're not good ones and well it's their right you know essentially people can die with their rights on so I think that some of the risk issue is how do we reconceive it what is acceptable risk and let's start with that what can we live with and what can't we live with and how do we negotiate that because I think that the, per the, the whole change mechanism to me is it's almost going from a, and you raised it a lot in your conversations about, we feel we have to have the answers. That's what we would call an A4B model, isn't it? You know, B doesn't have any of the answers, so we have to have them. Um, actually, B does have the answers, but so does A. To, to deny that you've got something to bring to the equation is foolish. Of course you have something to bring to the equation. To deny that... Uh, people with disabilities and their families have something to bring to the equation is foolish. It's how do you get the witness? What can you live with? What can we live with? Um, and I think part of how you start that change is you confront the real story. You tell things as they are. So if people are wanting some of these things in their life, you might have to say it's going to be really difficult for us to support you there right now because we're constrained by these things. How can we make make a middle ground? And then we can learn about that. I think one of the other things that agencies can be very, very effective in doing in bringing around change is forming bureaucratic shields. How do you make your bureaucracy more user friendly? And that so that the bureaucracy and the requirements and the policies and all of these things that you're dealing with over here are not impacting on the lives of people. People can still actually get on with their lives and you manage the shield between your reporting to government and the life opportunities that people are having. I think that's one of the real key things um, to think through. I think this issue of needs, we need to be careful we don't get confused about it. I, I, I would not advocate that you abandon needs because we all have them. What I would say you abandon is deficits. Um, and ask, uh, if you start to confront needs more broadly, you get a much better sense of what a person actually needs. And what we tend to confront is the deficits of people. And therefore, we build our whole structures around taking care of the deficits, but we don't ask ourselves the question, what's the person's need for love? What's the person's need for contribution? What's the person's need for relationship? What's the person's need for a sense of future? Because they are equally needs. So they are kind of the fundamental needs that actually need to be taken care of. Um, they are what you would, would be at all of our ordinary needs. Then you look at what are the particular needs therefore that this individual person might have. Um, yeah, what else have I got to say really? Um, I think the other thing is there is a tendency in change processes like this to beat yourselves up and to, um, to, to, to kind of see that you're not getting to a place and um, and dismiss your efforts. Your efforts, every effort is worth taking and I think we, maybe the question is, could we do this for 10 people, do you think? Do you think we could just do it for 10 of the people we support? And if we could do it for 10 people, what have we learnt? Because maybe then we could do it for 20. And that's where I think you get to your tipping point without destabilising um, things.
things that are happening within your system. The other thing I think is very, very important in, t in terms of your story is you celebrate the really great things. Because if you can't tell the stories about the lives that people are engaging on or people themselves tell those stories, you'll never get the white swans. So you must have them and they must be out there. But don't, um, don't be too convinced by your own rhetoric, if you know what I mean. Um, somewhere inside the organisation, you have to actually confront the real story. Um, isn't it fantastic that we're doing this for these people, but what about our struggle here? And I think the other message that I would give you is that it actually is a struggle. And you know that you're engaging in the struggle. The point is to not throw up your hands and say it's actually too much of a struggle. I mean, I thought the the conversation was interesting around boards. I don't think we've done as well as we need to have boards who are change agents. And this issue about growth, you know, um, if you're going to grow, ask the board how many people they think they're disappointing now. <laughs> because how many more do you want to disappoint? Mm. Um, do you think mm. maybe our growth is around getting it right for the Sorry, people I don't, now? I don't think the board sees that they're disappointing anybody. The CEO mm. might be disappointing them. The agency mm. may be disappointing mm. people. And if we are, let's not disappoint more mm. until we can get people mm. saying, we're coming, organisations will grow when people say that's the organisation we're taking our money to. And that won't be because you've got the best brochures and the biggest glossy whatever. It'll be because you deliver it. And that's where I think, if you talk to the boards about growth, the growth strategy comes from. When we've got 20 stories that we can share and we can talk about what it takes to get those stories, then we will have growth. We will change the purchasing arrangements and power for people. And I agree with you, your people are your gold. Sometimes, though, we haven't got our people well matched to the roles that they are most successful in, and we need to think about that. That's your duck corner. Before we thank you, Lorna, we'll take a reflection from mm. Ben and mm. from Shirley. So thank you. Ben. Um, yeah, I guess. I think today has been like really amazing. Like, I think I'm going to go away from today with a massive amount of reflection. Um, I think the one thing that stuck with me was actually like what Cheryl said, where when she was talking to the guys at our group, and some of the guys I really know, I know really really well, and she said that some of them are almost like scared of choice and what that really is. And I think, as Lorna said, like as disability sort of organisations like have we done the right job for them up until mm. this point and are we going that right point now so I think that's something I really took from today and something I know in the future within my work as well as just personal something I'm going to be thinking about so that's well, thank you very much for your deep reflection yeah. Shirley mm. I found the conversation was powerful remind you about Stephen Stewart. It'd be really great if you could send the contingent of people to Stephen. Um, I think he's going to uh, have something really very good for. 
So we'll see you for Stephen Sturt on, um, it's not next week, it's the mm. following Wednesday. What date is it? Yes. First of May, and on May Day. And, uh, you know, and if you can't come or if one of your partners can't come, do send somebody else along. That would be great. Or if you'd like to bring somebody else with you. So go well, and uh, all that food always gets left over, so if you want to take something for afternoon tea for your colleagues, do take something. Thank you. I'll just do a quick little um, sure. advertisement for the Imagine Better conference this year. Imagine Better hosts an international conference every year in Auckland. It'll be in November in Auckland this year, and it's called There's More to Life Than Services, Exploring Alternatives to the Current Human Service Models. So that could be something that... Um, mm.